Hey what's up everybody, it's Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome back to another video in MXGP Pro where today we're going to be discussing the 2018 MXGP of Turkey that just happened over the past weekend. Uh, AMA racing of course now done for the season, but the GPs are still going, they're still uh, well, before this weekend, there are still three rounds to go. Now, there's two rounds to go after Turkey has come and gone. Uh, so, again, if you're watching this video and you're expecting to see the actual uh, Turkey track, uh, which is not in MXGP Pro, I'm sorry to tell you, this is just me a, a video of me playing WW Motocross Park while discussing the MXGP of Turkey and uh, giving you guys a little insight on what happened, some of my thoughts and opinions on it all. And let's dive in, shall we? I'm gonna start with the MX2 class today um, because the MX2 class from the MXGP of Turkey provided probably the largest talking point in the last uh, couple of weekends, honestly. It's been kind of a fairly cut and dry uh, last few GPs, seemingly. Uh, Jonas has sort of started getting back into the mix, but he lost the points lead. Um, whatever it was about four rounds ago to Prado and Prado's kind of just taken the reins and ran with them uh, however we finally had kind of a a run-in between these two um, they you know it's technically speaking they aren't teammates they are on the same brand of bike and sponsored by the same major sponsor but they pit under two different tents so Jonas pits under the uh, Red Bull KTM Factory Europe uh, rig and Prado pits under the Red Bull KTM Claudio De Carli team which is Antonio Cairoli's team so they really are two different teams even though like I said it's the same bike same sponsor they look the same um, you know the, the biggest difference is that Jonas wears Arai helmets Alpine Star gear Whereas Prado wears answer gear and aero helmets and like you can kind of tell the difference from that um, Regardless, they're not necessarily on the same team So there's there's never really been like any sort of team tactics involved with either of them uh, You know KTM overhead. I feel like probably doesn't want them to run into each other But as long as the KTM wins the world championship I don't think they really care that much and that's definitely gonna happen this year But he's too far back at this point um, so anyway, the, th the thing I'm talking about, and I, again, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the GP, I try to wait as long as I can to do these videos before I start talking about them, but basically what happens is Jonas is leading the first moto in Turkey, and Prado is kind of regrouping after a couple mistakes and has passed in the second, caught up to Jonas, and is starting to battle him for the lead, and putting the pressure on him. They go over the finish line jump. They're pretty nearly side by side. Uh, Jonas on the outside, Prado on the inside coming into the next corner, which was like a inside roller, like kind of semi fast, like 45 degree turn. Um, or I guess it would be, yeah, like a 45 degree turn. It's, you know, like half of a 90, if you can imagine. Um, so it's, you know, kind of really just like a fast kink. Uh, and it has an inside roller option to hit or an outside smooth line, but nobody is hitting the like outside smooth line because it would really just kind of put you in the wrong location uh, for going forward on the track, I guess. So everybody was hitting this inside roller and there's two different lines that you could approach it with. And the line that Jonas was approaching it with is like this outside across the inside sweep maneuver. And the line that Prado was hitting it at uh, in this particular instance was like, come charging down the far inside and try to use that roller as like a semi like berm slash embankment to kind of turn off of it while launching down the inside um and so what happened is prado's charging down the inside jonas apparently didn't see him coming and jonas does his launch across the inside move prado does his you know try to turn off the inside but really what he does is kind of go straight on almost off of it and they hit in midair. Jonas kind of lands on the back of Prado, and then his you know his bike hits the ground, and he hits the ground, and it kind of takes off and like creates this big dust storm. And Prado, after Jonas's bike like shrugs off his shoulders, lands, realizes it's not going to make the corner, then pins it off the edge of the track. It was like a chicane, so 
it, you know, is like a chicane coming back onto the start straight. So he pins it straight off the track and then cuts the track a pretty good bit and then rejoins on the first turn area of uh, the start straight. There's videos of it everywhere. If you just go look up Prado Jonas turkey crash online right now, you'll find it. Um, big moment in the championship because, you know, they're still within reach of each other for the championship as opposed to the GP class, which is pretty much out of reach at this point. And with, you know, three GPs to go, it's still kind of anybody's race. It's not necessarily that Prado's taking this thing all the way to the wire. And with Jonas looking as good as he did, you know, Prado obviously wanted to make a statement, get around him and try to win the race. But where he did it was kind of weird to me. Um, I felt like there was better opportunities for passing on the track. And then I rewatched this thing over and over again. And I wasn't there. So, again, I'm not going to be like the best judge of this all. But just from what I saw of the video of it and seeing what people were doing in that corner lap after lap. I mean, I would have to say that of the blame pie here, I would put a little bit more on Prado just because, may, yeah, maybe he did have a wheel on Jonas and Jonas' his situational awareness for this whole thing was kind of poor and he should have seen him coming. But even if Jonas, I, like, I feel like even if Jonas had seen him coming and checked up, there's like a point oh five percent chance that prado makes the corner i mean that's how hard he came down the inside and how far he launched off the inside roller it's not like he had jonas land on him and it spit him off the track in some weird direction i mean he barely landed on the track still after coming down and then realized it was either going straight into a, a pile of tough blocks or just pinning it off the track and going across this huge water splash that was off the side of the track um like I, I just yes Jonas deserves some of the blame but I mean where are you going Prado like yeah you, you have a 30 point lead in the championship you could coast this thing home with a couple of seconds for the rest of the the season and still win the world title and like you're gonna go for that type of a pass on your teammate I mean like all you're doing is angering KTM to do something like that and then you're you're pissing off kind of your number one rival here. Like, not that Jonas was going to play fair to begin with, but now I foresee Jonas, like, any chance he gets, he's putting Prado on the deck. And, like, I mean, not that I think that that's necessarily fair game because he does deserve some of the credit here, but if you're Jonas, like, why not? Like, you just had this dude cross-jump Carl you pretty dang hard, take you out, you ended up on the ground, and then he seemed to have, like, no remorse. And, in fact, you know, Prado kind of blamed him for it. You know, I listened to some post-race post race podcasts with Prado and he 100% said like Jonas has to have better situational awareness which I agree with and he's like yeah he just pinned it and jumped onto the back of me and I was just like I don't really know if that's 100% true like he definitely kind of threw it down the inside a little harder than I think pretty much anybody on earth had expected you to do there um, so like I said it, you know it's not necessarily 100% Prado's fault but I, I see it as more Prado's fault than Jonas and I'd love to hear your guys' opinion on it because like I said it is kind of the biggest talking point and it seems like people are pretty 50-50 split on the whole situation um, but what it ended up doing in the end was Jonas got up from his crash uh, his bike was a little bit bent up and it took him a while to get going so he ended up finishing sixth Prado you know went off the track and got back on the track still in the lead um, but apparently had gotten some scrapes and bruises from Jonas's bike sliding across his back and quickly lost the lead to Thomas Covington who ended up winning the first moto uh, and then I think uh, Thomas Kerr Olsen also got around Prado um, so he ended up in third in the first moto so he actually gained points on Jonas in that first moto alone but then the second moto comes around and something was just well off with Prado. Like he actually got a semi-decent start and was up there and then just threw out the anchor with like 10 minutes to go and start, you know, let Ben Watson through. I think he let Olsen through and then let Rodriguez go and ended up seventh uh, in the second moto, which is, you know, just not characteristic of Prado the way he's been on form lately. Um, so, you know, he was also saying that it's not anything big. It's just a couple bumps and bruises and he just didn't really feel it that second moto. But what it does kind of do, I feel like here, is, you know, Jonas is already looking pretty good again. But now I feel like he's got a real fire lit under him where, like, before he was kind of like, yeah, you know, Prado, uh, we've had good races, never really had any run-ins. Like, 
these guys are so weird kind of mentally that of course Jonas doesn't want to lose the world title but like this is going to be like infuriating now I feel like if he does um, to Prado because of this situation so I think that's going to you know give him a little extra oomph these last couple GPs at Assen and um, Imola so I don't know man like you know play with the bull and get the horn sometimes is what I what comes across my mind here and like I just don't feel like Prado necessarily needed to do that in that situation like he could have easily settled in for a second or even got passed by Covington who was closing in with Olsen and you know got a third or a fourth and not had been involved in this maybe not have gotten injured for that second moto um, it was pretty hot so I understand him fading from that aspect too but man what a weird circumstance like in all all of the things that I could have thought about would happen down the stretch in this championship I wouldn't have thought Prado with the points lead would have had something like this happen um, I would have thought Jonas would have gotten like kind of desperate and made something like that happen and again I think people are going to fall on two sides of the coin here I'm not saying I'm 100% right I'm just you know offering my thoughts and opinions on what I felt happened uh, from what I saw in the replays and slowing it down and watching full race footage to see where everybody was going in that corner so again, that's why I'm asking, you know, open up the discussion here, see where your guys' head is on it, um, to see if I'm just a complete idiot or maybe if I'm actually speaking some sensical bits into this. Um, but yeah, going to make some interesting racing at Assen in two weeks' time. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of excited to see what happens now. I kind of, you know, really ignited a flame into this. MX2 world title. I think uh, I think Prado's points lead is still 23 points, so he's still fairly comfortable. You know, he could still coast out uh, with seconds and thirds and win the world championship from here. Uh, but it certainly does add quite a bit of uh, fuel to the flame here. So I'm excited to see it. Uh, as for the MXGP class, Hurlings was actually uh, f I think he had a, a food poisoning sickness all weekend long or something like that. Uh, definitely was not feeling very good on Saturday and said he was actually feeling better on Sunday in some of the interviews I heard with him um, but he still seemed a little bit off in the second moto the first moto he was fine looked great uh, dealing with the heat I think got to him in the second moto still won the moto I mean you know for hurlings on a track that definitely isn't something I would consider his forte and to be sick and have all this pressure from Tim Geyser in the second moto uh, pretty wild that he's able still able to still go 1-1 I think that speaks volumes to where his level of speed and skill is comparatively to the field right now which I mean that is that is not a slouchy field you know like I chose Geyser to ride with here because I actually wanted to talk about Geyser for a second and how kind of impressed I am with him coming around to late season form here I mean he's had a rough go of it lately with injuries and just never really seemed to get back to his comfort level that he had when he won the world title in 2016 um but he's really stepped it up and kind of risen to the occasion lately in the pressure he was putting on hurlings in that second moto i was like man this is this is awesome to see like old geysers back a little bit you know so um glad to see geysers is, has found his form uh disappointing to see that Cavroli is still nursing some issues here uh i had a uh, lower leg injury and apparently re-aggravated it with a crash in the second moto this past weekend um, to the point where he got up and practically dead last, which it's a, you know, a, a GP dead last is like 27th. So he wasn't like really way down the order per se, like in the USA, you'd definitely be 40th if you crashed on the first lap of the race. Um, but he got up and charged his way up to 15th. I think just enough to keep the world championship alive. I think Hurlings has a, uh, 95 point lead now with two, two rounds to go. So there's only a hundred points left on the table. I mean, it basically takes a uh, hurlings disaster at this point for him not to win the world championship. But it is, like I said, a little sad to see Tony uh, dealing with these injuries. He They just announced the Italian Motocross the Nations team this past week, and it's a pretty good one. It's going to be um, Michele Chervelin on a 250 and Alessandro Lupino with Antonio Cairoli on a 450. And that's, I mean, that is pretty much Italy's A team. That is a team that honestly if everything goes according to plan is definitely top five if not podium material still i feel like they're a long shot to win even if tony goes one one um but my hope is that he's not too badly damaged from this season that seemed to wearing seems to be wearing him down and he just keeps getting hurt uh, as the season comes to a close that he still is able to recover 
uh, before the donations and come into top form there. Uh, because as a fan myself, I would love to see everybody in top form going to donations. Um, and last talking point of the MXGP of Turkey that I want to hit on because everybody was talking about it and asking about it and you know, the whole nine yards was uh, Roman Fevre had a very violent get off on Saturday during qualifying. And as bad as it ended up looking, it. And again, I want to reiterate that head injuries are no joke. And I think that they're probably the worst injury that these guys can deal with. Um, barring, you know, permanent damage. Uh, you know, if they get paralyzed, that's obviously worse. But, you know, head injuries are no joke. However, as violent as Fevra's crash was, and you expect the worst, you know, broken this, broken that, things gonna, that are going to put him out for months. Uh, he ended up only with a cracked rib, which isn't obviously great but it's better than you know splitting an arm or a leg and uh and a pretty heavy concussion and the rumor is that he is going to be like pretty well ready to go and they're going to take it day by day and he might even be ready for Assen in two weeks um but these heavy concussions can be really kind of hit or miss like Anstey had a pretty big one at the beginning of the season and it has taken him a hell of a long time to get rolling since then um you know the the obvious fear is that that's the same case for Fevra but the big talking point with all this is if Fevra is not ready to go for motocross the nations obviously choice number one for France should be Marvin Muscan to slot into that position and it 100% depends on Fever's health for the next couple weeks. I mean, like, if he is still seeing stars in two weeks, there's a decent enough chance that maybe he does have to withdraw. I mean, we're still five weeks from donations. It's a long ways to consider that happening. And after everything that's been said by the French Federation and Marvin and all this stuff like that, I don't even know if Fever can't go that Marvin will go. But that's just something that was brought up this past weekend um, as a potential thing happening Nobody knows if it would happen or how Fever is doing, uh, you know, two days later after his crash. Um, like I said, most signs point to him being okay. He already made a social media post explaining that, you know, he had a pretty heavy concussion and a fractured rib. Um, but, you know, checked out from the medical facility should be good to, you know, I think he's actually already back in France now, um, resting and trying to get better. So... You know, I hope Fevra is okay for his sake. Uh, but like I said, that does potentially leave a slot open on Motocross Nations Team France if he's not able to go. I still think he will be. I mean, Fevra is the type of guy that will muscle through just about anything. Uh, I would have wouldn't have even put it past him if he did crack an arm in that crash that he would you know would have said no i'm gonna be good to go like let's get a rod in it and i'll just ride with it like he's a pretty tough character and uh i don't foresee this taking him out but again just another talking point to discuss as a potential change coming maybe down the road uh in the near future but yeah hurling takes a 95 point lead into his home race in Aston in two weeks uh pretty likely he clinches the world title there which would be I think pretty cool for him to do in front of his home fans, uh, Dutch world champion, uh, you know, at the Dutch GP. Um, and then, yeah, things heating up between Prado and Jonas and Covington, the American rider wins the GP in the MX2 class. Cool to see last time they had an MXGP of Turkey. Fun fact for you uh, fans out there. The last time MXGP Tur of Turkey happened in 2009, Zach Osborne won the MX2 uh, overall that day so kind of a little funny connection there that nine years later an American once again does win the MXGP of Turkey um, and uh, ends up being potentially Zach Osborne's pr replacement really because he's going to be on Rockstar Husky in the USA next year so yeah that is a synopsis of the MXGP of Turkey with a little action here at WW Motocross Park and MXGP Pro hope you guys enjoyed the video again would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on uh, anything I've rambled on about or maybe something that I missed that you guys would also like to, you know, hear about or talk about, um, hit us up in the comment section below. And uh, thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.